Hi, this is Lou, and welcome to episode number two of the Lou Vudo podcast show. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, today I have a great guest again, Pete Wilcox, a friend of mine, someone who performed uh, at Memories Theater before I was there, and uh, I came and he was leaving to go back to Las Vegas, but uh, what a great interview. Pete has so, mu so many great stories, and he's had so many great opportunities in his lifetime. Uh, he's known as the Hollywood Elvis. He has been known as that for many, many years. Anyway, I think you're going to love this interview. It's really, really great. I'm doing, this is the second Elvis guy I'm, I'm interviewing. And of course, I've been an Elvis tribute artist myself for many years. But uh, because it is August, around the time of the anniversary of Elvis's passing, so I thought it would be great to, uh, to do this a little bit. I plan on interviewing other people in the entertainment field, not just Elvis tribute artists, but once again, I just thought this would be a great thing to do, being it is August. So, enjoy this episode of the Lou Vudo podcast show. I know you're going to love Pete, and uh, please subscribe to my channel, and uh, also click on the bell so you will be notified whenever new episodes are posted. Thank you again, and uh, I hope you enjoy this episode. Hey, it's the Lou Fudo Podcast. What, like you got something better to do? Well, welcome to this uh, second episode of the first season of the Lou Vudo podcast on YouTube. Thank you for joining us today. Today we have another special guest, a great guy. Uh, I've gotten to know him a little bit over the last several years. He's known as the Hollywood Elvis, and it's Pete Wilcox. He's an actor, a singer, but most of all, an entertainer. Uh, Billboard magazine, by the way, said that Pete Wilcox is a real per in-person find one of the rare breed of true rock entertainers. The New York Daily News said when he was performing on the Legends show, Legends is a rousing success. The showstopper is Pete Wilcox. And in the San Francisco Chronicle, they said on stage, Wilcox becomes Elvis. So welcome, Pete Wilcox. It's so great to have you. I don't know who you're talking about. That was all real nice. You read them, you read them just like I wrote them. <laughs> oh, my goodness. No, it's I, good uh, to have you, Pete. It's, uh, I didn't include the one that said uh, he's a little longer tooth and he should never have given up the day job. Those are not in the press kit, you know. Oh, my goodness. Uh, see, I just embarrassed you a little well, bit. Well, yeah, while we're giving accolades, I have to say Lou is one of the most charming men I ever met. When I was working down in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, um, my career in life took me back home to Las Vegas, and Lou came in, and uh, we enjoyed each other very much. I wish I had a chance to spend some more time with you, but... Uh, yeah, well, we've kind of... Uh, interacted online, but it was special to be able to, I think we we're side by side in the condos for about a week or two. And so, uh, oh, okay. I, yeah, I don't remember. You know what I do remember was I was at that particular time in my life, I was very seriously contemplating leaving, uh, performing. And if I'm not mistaken, I gave you the black leather jacket. Uh, yes, you did actually. I'd forgotten yeah. about that. I thought yeah. so. Uh, listen, I was thinking about maybe using that again. So if you would just bundle that up and <laughs> ship it to me now, I, you know. Well, I gave it to an, another friend of mine, the guy who did Conway Twitty, Travis James. Oh, my goodness. 
That is, oh. it, that's really funny to pass along a tradition like that. It's kind of cool. Yeah. I was going to buy another um, leather jacket like that because it's one of the one of the few costumes that you can kind of interchange and stick around with different looks, and it looks kind of fun. Right. They were making them out of England, and uh, as I have done, as you can see, I've kind of stretched my look quite a bit. You put that jacket on, and it's kind of fun. It, you yeah. want to find a way to bring the image and bring the 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 uh, atmosphere, and yet sometime, somehow maintain some sort of a, a look and a feel of our own. As we get older, we can no longer, the magic seems to dissipate a little. I don't know what's going on with that. Yeah, I don't know, time. Well, it's really good to have you, and thank you for agreeing to, to do this. Oh, my, this is really my pleasure, because uh, this is one of the few ways we have now to reach the people, say hi, Right. Um, and I know what's so fun about this is a lot of the people from Pigeon Forge are friends of yours, and they'll be tuning in, and there's a chance for me to say hello to those wonderful people. They were I was only there a year and a half, but Michael and Dee made it seem like 10 years. Ah. That's, a, that's, a, that's, that's another story, you know. <laughs> it seemed like 10. But the people didn't. The people were absolutely wonderful. They were so kind. And what was so fun about that is there was a regular audience of about 50 to 100 people. They'd come all the time, and uh, it kept you on your toes, but it was also very um, reassuring, very reassuring. I, I enjoyed my time in Tennessee. When did you actually start uh, show business, I guess? You know, it's so funny that you asked me that because I, I this is something I've been wanting to include and this is going to give me, I think, a slight edge on the ETA world, which God knows we all need. Um, but some people say, when did you start doing Elvis? I think I can claim the official first spot. Now listen to this. Right. I was in the eighth grade, and it was Monday, the first day of the week. And we used to do a thing called air guitar. You know what air guitar is? Okay. Okay. The song that we all did air guitar in the 50s was Rock Around the Clock. Huh. The solo, for those of you that remember, went like this. And we do it, and you play the guitar, and you jump around. All right, the teacher walked out of the school. Well, from the third grade on, when the teacher left the class, I turned into the class idiot. That was just... My first role, you know, and it had nothing to do with Elvis. I think I was trying to be Jerry Lewis. <laughs> but this particular Monday, the teacher walked out of the class, and I got up, did air guitar to rock around the clock. And everybody clapped and laughed, and I sat down. And the kid I sat in front of, his name was David Howell. David says to me, who are you supposed to be, Elvis Presley? And I said, who's Elvis Presley? He said, you didn't see the Tommy Jimmy Dorsey stage show last week? I said, no, who's he? Oh, he's this new rock and roll singer. He was on there. That was the first time he was on TV. That was a Saturday. Wow. By Monday, I was doing Elvis. <laughs> Boom. I'm the first. <laughs> you heard it here on the Lou Budo Show. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Dean Z and Sean Clush and Billy Boom Bots weren't even born yet. <laughs> Excuse me. Right. <laughs> No, I, and you know what's funny? I remember then um, the New York Times Sunday paper had a thing called This Week, and that was their um, magazine section. You know, there would be a picture and, you know, some ads, and you could join, join get a record contract with Columbia Records. But anyway, they had a, um, there was a picture of Elvis Presley, and it was a picture on his second album cover, and it's a profile. He's like just playing the guitar. And I looked at it, and I thought, oh, my God, I kind of look like this guy. I mean, I've never looked just, nobody looks just like him, but I recall the image for you. Yeah. And uh, I saw it. And, and what was funny, he was wearing a striped shirt, and my dad had the exact same shirt. <laughs> so I, of course, stole that out of his closet, and he never saw that again. But uh, I was enchanted by him, and I didn't know what it meant. But here we are at 13 years of age. What you're trying to do is get recognition. You're trying to get the um, girl's attention. Right. Uh, you're trying to be somebody. You're trying to find out, what can I do here? 
Um, and I had two shots. I either wanted to be a pitcher on the Brooklyn Dodgers or I wanted to be, oh, I wanted to be Errol Flynn. I really loved him. I'll tell you my Errol Flynn story. But Elvis, and I think this, you probably feel the same way. I never wanted to be him, but I did want to be like him. I wanted to do, can I do something like him? Will my life open up? What did your dad do for work? Because there's a picture of your dad and Elvis in the 50s. Okay, this is really cool. When my In the 30s, actually, <clears throat> excuse me, my dad invented the idea of rating movies. He was working at Parents Magazine, mm -hmm. and he said, why don't we rate the movies so the parents will know if it's okay to send their kids? Mm -hmm. uh, they were starting to, just starting to get, you know, questions. The dark movies, I don't know if I want to send my five, six-year-old kid to see that. Right. So he went to Hollywood. They sent him every year to Hollywood, and he would meet the new child star, Elizabeth Taylor, Roddy McDowell, uh, Mickey Rooney. But the one guy that just was really cool, the one guy who he really took a liking to, and he liked my dad, was Walt Disney. Hmm. And uh, as a matter of fact, I only went to Hollywood. Mom and I went one year. I think I was, I think I was four. And um, Walt was very kind, walked me all around his studio holding my hand. Wow. And, and at the end of the day, said to my mom, I was kind of a hyperactive kid. I know I was. That, you know, that explains why I am what I am now. And uh, he says to my mom, he says, I love this kid. Can I use him in movies? And my mom says, uh, are your children in movies? Says, oh, no, oh, no, no. <laughs> and she says, oh, no, I shouldn't have said that, should I? Mom, my, you got to love my mom. She says, well, I just want him to grow up normal. Yeah. Mom, we didn't make it. Yeah. But at any rate, uh, and I always say, I could have been with Annette instead of Frankie Avalon, but I'm, I'm <laughs> over that now. Right. I'm over that now. But to answer your question, he called me in 1956 uh, and said to me, um, tomorrow I have uh, me at lunch, to have lunch with Pat Boone. Is that any good? I said, Dad, Pat Boone, my God, he's a big star. That's great. He says, yeah, then I think at 2 o'clock I'm supposed to see this other kid. I think it's uh, Elvis Presley. We always started screaming. Yeah. I, most of the East Coast heard me screaming. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was just the most wonderful. And you come back, and there's a wonderful picture. My dad is playing the ukulele, and Elvis is singing with him. And he was, oh, it was, it was one of those I've been fortunate enough in my life to have some very unusual connections to Elvis. Yeah. Not that it makes me special or anything, but it did. It looks good on the resume. Yeah. And no, that's. You know, and it's fun in a conversation. We're all the same. We're all fellow Americans, fellow Earthlings, and we all loved him. That's really the bottom line. And for some reason or another, I have been allowed to walk next to the figure a couple of times. Yeah, Not yeah. like Charlie. We work with Charlie. For God's sakes, Charlie lived in a house with him. There's the guy. Charlie was such a dreamy guy. I remember, and he was so, so helpful. And I know he did this with you on stage. Yeah. I remember I'd turn around and he'd be walking behind me carrying the cord. You know what I mean? And I said, wait a minute, ladies and gentlemen, I'd, I'd stop the show and said, Obviously, you guys know I love Elvis. I mean, I just, that's the way it is. Everybody in this room loves Elvis. And I'm very honored to do a tribute to him. But I want you to look at this man standing next to me. He's standing here holding my microphone cord mm -hmm. the same way he did for Elvis. He's a supportive, loving man. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a tribute to Elvis. This is Charlie Hodge. He's the real deal. Right. You know, and he, when I got there, Lou, he was, his dressing room was a nail in the band room. Had a nail back there with his, with his tux hang. I said, what? You're crazy. Get down here in my room. Biggest mistake I've made in my life. The guy smoked like a dragon. <laughs> I, oh, my God. The, my clothes stunk. Did yeah. he, was he, I mean, he pulled it on you, too, I bet. Yeah, yeah. Well, and uh, kind of interesting, so many of the things that you said during the show, like what you just talked about, I picked up from you. Because when, seriously, when I got there, I was so green. I mean, I don't know if there's a greener color than green, but I was so green and inexperienced. And during those couple of weeks, we were both in town together. You helped me quite a bit. Um, well, one thing you did, 
we were staying in the condo next to each other. And one morning the bell rang and I opened the door. He said, uh, get dressed and come next door. I'm going to show you how to do makeup. Now I'd never done makeup in my life. And, uh, but what made me laugh when you were telling me you were in the bathroom mirror doing the mascara and then you put this on your eyes and you turned to me and said, now, once you learn how to do this, right, you want to wear this everywhere. Walmart, Kroger. <laughs> hey, come on. I get out of bed with the stick. Well, here we go. Yeah. Now you got to remind me to put my teeth in. How do you like that? Oh my but, God. But you, you were so helpful and so kind when I just first got there. But I picked up so many of the things that you said in the show because they were like that thing you just mentioned was just such a great thing. And I, I felt the same way, you know, that here I'm up here pretending, but this guy was there. I know. I know. Now, were your parents very supportive when you started, started out? My dad, my dad always was. It was Thanksgiving, and a friend called and said, Pete, I need you down here. Can you come sing for an hour or so? I said, sure. So I went, and my dad and mom and dad joined me later, and I sang uh, a wonderful old song, a Judy Garland song, You Made Me Love You, I Didn't Want to Do It. And when I sang that, my dad stood up and gave me a standing ovation. Wow. And it was so sweet, and it just touched my heart. And I said to mom, wow. She said, I know, I couldn't believe my eyes. She said, I wonder what that song meant to him, and we never discussed it. But my mom, on the other hand, had been a singer in New York. She sang at a place called the Rainbow Room, which is in the RCA building. Oh, I've heard of it, yeah. Yeah, very famous. My mom sang opposite Mary Martin back in the uh, late 30s, early 40s, because I was born in 43, so it must have been, yeah, it must have been the late 30s because she married my dad around 1940. Hmm. Um, she was very, very, very supportive. Uh, I, I couldn't have done what I did without her help. When Elvis passed away, I was studying acting at the time, and I was already doing Elvis's voice for television, but I considered myself a singer-songwriter. I was more like, I, I say I was kind of like Neil Diamond, James Taylor, Mac Davis. I wanted to be, I wish then you'd say Pete Wilcox. That was what I was aspiring to be. They were doing, they were looking for someone to do Elvis's voice for television. And I was working with a man called Don Randy at the baked potato. And he said, oh, I got the guy. You got to come here. So that was how I got the job going into the Elvis thing. But it was just something I did. It, was, it wasn't a throwaway. It was very special. But I was still singer, songwriter, studying acting. Right. In light of, of you going to acting school and being an actor, you actually were on several sitcoms and TV shows through the years. Um, as a matter of fact, I mentioned this, but they called you the Hollywood, or they still do call you the Hollywood Elvis because you were in so many. I was very, very fortunate. Um, I think the first one, as I, as I recall it, was um, a TV show called The Last Precinct. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, it was like a sitcom. It was like, um, actually, it was almost like the Keystone Cops or Car 54, Where Are You? Well, I think it had 13 episodes and it got pulled. I remember I had quite, quite a um, confronting situation trying to get that role. The Elvis in Legends and Contra was trying to get it as well, but he didn't have any acting experience. When the gun came on, when you were in the room and you were doing the thing, I think he fell down. And that was my blessing, that I was prepared for that moment. Yeah, yeah. And then Hollywood has a way of saying, oh, get the guy that was on that show. Get the guy that was on that show. They just started handing me. Uh, the Hogan family was great, great fun with Sandy Duncan and Cheers Designing Women, Murphy Brown, and Full House. Full House was just a dream because that's my buddy Johnny Stamos. Right. And uh, uh, he's a story all on his own. Now, it's, you know, it's funny. In, in, in Graceland, when you put the headphones on, you're walking around. It's John Stamos. Leading you to uh, oh, Grayson, yeah. I didn't know. I didn't realize that. Huh. Yeah. Wow. So, and then, uh, of course, you're in your uh, promo reel. It shows you singing at the Rose Bowl in front of twenty thousand people. What was yeah. that like? That was. Uh, it's surreal. Yeah. It's surreal. Uh, it was part of a Legends and Concert show, right. but uh, uh, yeah, twenty thousand people. Unless, I guess, unless you're Elvis, it's 
<laughs> it, it's surreal. They're so far away from you, and you know that it's happening. Right. It's not as much fun as 100 people. 100 people is a lot more fun. You tell a joke, you look somebody in the face, how you doing, woof, woof, woof. Right. And say, uh, you know, I like that shirt, too. I had to clean the burn. Whatever it might be, you know what I mean? You, right. you could play around. 20,000 people, you know, I can't even see them. Look like ants out there. But the the fact that you're doing it is very exciting in your spirit. Right. Now, how did the memories gig come along? Um, uh, that's a very funny story, actually. I was in a show in Las Vegas called Superstars, and John Stewart, the producer of Legends of Concert, was going to go into Memories Theater. They were having problems with an Elvis in the show. He, John Stewart went over, went in and was going to try to take over the theater and do Legends of Concert there. And uh, the road manager was a friend of mine. And he talked to Michael. He said, you don't need to put Legends of Concert here. Just replace the Elvis guy. He said, well, you got anybody that good? He said, I got a handful of guys that can do that. Yeah. And uh, uh, there was another fella and I that were kind of upward at the last minute. And Michael flew out to uh, Las Vegas to see me. And uh, he and Bridget were very kind. They liked what I did. And uh, they took a shot. They, they gave me the opportunity to come down there. And I just, truly, I just absolutely loved it. To work with Charlie was a dream. Yeah, yeah, the guys yeah. in the band knew every song. I came in, they knew 100 songs. Right. And uh, the people were so welcoming and kind. I missed my home, like I can't tell you. I missed my mother. I adored my mother. And, I, and for that reason, I wanted to go back to Las Vegas, and I wound up there. Yeah. But my, my time in Pigeon Forge was one of my most special years. It truly was. Right. And, and there's so many things with you to talk about, and just a lot of things come to mind. You'd mentioned about working with Charlie, but you knew Charlie well before Memories Theater. Uh, you would you would actually run into Elvis. Yes, yes, yes. Um, well, I ran into Charlie first. Let me see if I can get the story, how I get it right. Um, I was working in a little club in, in Hollywood, and I met a girl who used to date Charlie. And uh, she said, oh, my God, Charlie's, you know, I can't wait to bring him down there. She brought Charlie down to see me in a club. And... Uh, we went back to her house, and there were a couple, maybe four or five of us, and I started telling Charlie stories about how my dad met him. And uh, when I was in the Army, I got out of the Army before I was 21. A guy that was 21 gave me his ID. He said, here, you need this so you can get in nightclubs. I cut a picture of Elvis out of Hit Parade magazine, put it over the guy singing, that's, that's what I use this. Uh, so I said to Charlie, oh, my God, he said, the boss will get such a kick out of you. But it never happened. He never got to bring me in. About a year later, I was in the famous Schwab's drugstore. And I was like this, I was looking at a magazine, and I put it down, and bang, he was right there. I, I said, oh, oh my God, you're scaring the hell out of me. And he started to laugh, and so did I. Elvis. I, I was working next door, so I ran next door, I said, Elvis is next door to Schwab's drug. He said, well, go get him, see if we can bring him in. And I tried. I went next door, came back, and they said, we'll try to get him to come in. And when I went back in, uh, Joe Esposito was on this side, then Elvis, then Charlie. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry, the boss, um, we're running late, you know, but he just stopped to say hello to Frank Dakova, the chief, as I told you. And uh, he said, wait a minute, though. He said, do you do Elvis? Because I kind of looked like him. I didn't have a beard, had long sideburns and, and the hair. Right. Uh, and, he, and I said, well, I did his voice for TV. He said, oh, my God. And then they left. And I was like, oh, you know, I... I'll never forget that black Cadillac pulling out, man. I said, oh, my God, I wanted to be in that car so bad. Unbelievable. But yeah, it was really, really special. But uh, Happy Days one day, as you know, Elvis was watching Happy Days. Fonzie hit the jukebox, and Hound Dog came on. And Elvis says, uh, as the only Elvis can say it, I was like, hey, man, I, I wonder if I'm getting paid for that. And Charlie says, that ain't you, boss. I said, kid, you met in Schwab's. Uh, he said, wow. He said, man, that was good. I thought that was me. Okay, that was, I love telling that story, man. But I wanted to mention you're married to the love of your life, right? right? I am. Someone you, and we talked oh, no. about this, 
uh, you guys have known each other for a while. My whole life is like a storybook in a way. I'm so blessed. I had a friend on, on remember MySpace? Yeah. We all had MySpace. That was the first one. But I had a friend on there, and her name was Linda. And then MySpace ended. We all went to Facebook, and she came over there. And then we were friends on friend, on, on uh, Facebook for a while. And then about three years ago, she said, well, I'm having, uh, I'm getting over a tragedy. It's been a year, and my birthday's coming up. And I knew she was an Elvis fan, so I said, well, let me call you and sing happy birthday to you. I've had some people do favors for me. It would be a delight to do that for you. So reluctantly, I want to say, she gives me her number. I call her up, sing happy birthday. We talk for about hour, hour and a half. And then she says to me, you don't remember me, do you? Mm -hmm. I said, well, I don't know. I feel terrible, but can you, you know, tell me, help me recall. Right, right. Well, I'm going to give you two. And the first one, she says, you were singing in the Silverbird 38 years ago. You gave me a record from stage and you sang a song to me. And then afterwards, we had our picture taken. And you said to me, would you like to split a salad? So we did. We had the salad together. And, and then she said, then after that, I came to see you uh, several times in California where you were working. And this is kind of, she says, we used to walk to the car and we would smooch. <laughs> we never did anything outrageous, but we smooched. And then uh, we separated. And uh, I said, can you tell me a little bit more? And she said, well, I had a little boy. And I said, stop right there. I said, that was it. Because I had a son and I lost him at a very young age. I was a very stupid rock and roll man that walked away from a family. And I dated a girl that had a little boy and that didn't work out. So my heart was kind of broken at the idea of young children and I couldn't give her a husband at the time and I couldn't be a dad to the little boy. I was more about my career and what I was trying to do. And she didn't have any heart. She said, I understood that. And she said, I got to tell you another time, that was kind of cute. She says, we were at a restaurant and you were standing on a table drinking a margarita, singing, hit me with your best shot and you threw a handful of Dorito chips at me. I said, I remember that. That I remember. Because I remember the glowing smile that caught those Dorito chips. I said, oh my God. Well, that was in April. And from April to August, we talked 500 hours on the, t on the telephone. Wow. But we couldn't say goodbye to each other. Yeah, yeah. And then finally that Thanksgiving, I went down to see her, and she said, uh, I'd like to be your forever girlfriend. And I said, uh, I'd like that too. And we have been inseparable since. We have just been enjoying life like teenagers. We really have. Uh, our life is obsessed with each other. But the other thing that's come to us very, very powerfully is – my walk with Jesus has come back in extremely powerful in my life. For many years, I stepped back and was disappointed with some of the organized church and some of the things that I heard. And uh, I started looking at other possibilities, uh, always loving God, always loving Jesus. One night, uh, we're praying together, we're holding hands, and... Uh, I say, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. For the Christians now, uh, if you're not a Christian, you don't have to turn off the, the, the show or nothing. As a matter of fact, this might help you. This is a good story. Yes. Uh, Jesus, in the book of the Gospel of John, explains to them at the Last Supper how to pray. When I'm gone, you don't pray to me. You pray to my dad. You pray to God in my name. Come in my name. So anyway, Father, Linda and I come to you in the name of Jesus. We are so blessed to have you in our lives that you would put us back together and we want to serve you. We're not sure exactly how, but we know that you can tell us and we want to feel your presence. We want you to know that we are here. Uh, we wait to hear from you. Amen. That night, I'm having a dream, and in the dream, I'm hearing people holler song titles at me. Blah, 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 blah,
can't get any. Then I hear, and the grass won't pay no mind. Okay. Then I hear some more, and the grass won't pay no mind. I wake up. Linda, I had a dream last night, uh, you know, about song titles, and I heard this song title that I've never heard before. Have you ever heard it? And she says, no, I don't think so. She says, but I'll tell you what, why don't we look it up and see if there's a word or a phrase or something that relates to our prayer. I said, good idea. I said, okay. We look it up. It's a Neil Diamond song, as you know. And remember what we're asking for. We're asking God for direction, the connection. I get sent to a song I've never heard before. I go to the song, and the first line is, listen easy, you can hear God calling. I'm going to say it again. Listen easy, you can hear God calling. Right. It has nothing to do with the rest of the song. Right, right. It's a love song about Neil and his girlfriend making love by the river. Right. <laughs> but this part of the song stands on its own. So we took that as confirmation. For those of you who say, well, I don't know if there's a God, there's something. No, there's a God. He answered my prayer by the instruction given to me by his son, Jesus. That should answer a lot of questions for a lot of people. It turned my life around on a dime. I no longer want to be this wonderful singer hero guy. I mean, I still want to sing because that's what I do. Is I, you know, I don't know how to fix plumbing or electric, nothing. Right. But I, I do know how to kind of play around and entertain. Yeah. But um, I want to thank you for inviting me into this new world of yours. I want to jump into the Internet. Uh, I don't know if I'm a podcast guy or a regular um, devotional thing. I'm thinking about maybe doing uh, a semi-regular devotional thing, maybe read a little scripture, a little passage. Maybe right. we'll cut it up a little bit. Awesome. And uh, God bless you. Get out there and put it to work. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So that'd be fun. And maybe one once a month, you should too. Once a month, do a, a little variety show. Sing some songs. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because this may be the future. We may be in the future right here doing what we're doing. Right, right. Very insightful for you to do this. I wish you a lot of luck with it. Well, thank you so much. And thank you again for joining us. And uh, so hopefully we'll get to see you soon. And we'll otherwise, we'll see you on uh, the internet land or however you want to call that absolutely um what i usually put it on if i put it on facebook i'll usually put uh pete wilcox america's tv elvis and i i only say that because if i put pete wilcox they might not come I put america's tv elvis when people say, oh i wonder who that guy is that might give me a couple of extra uh listeners and i want the extra listeners for the fun of it and also for those of us that share a witness or testimony Right. Um, and our show right now, to today, what we shared together, on behalf of Lou and myself, I please, we all, we both ask you, share this with your friends. Let them hear that, because there might be something in that testimony or story that touches them. That must, they might like them. I, somebody sitting on a fence might need to have heard that. You never know. I, uh, but me and Lou, we're going to leave the building. <laughs> and before we do go... Do you have uh, a website? I know you have Facebook people can look you up on. I do. Bless your heart. Thank you so much for asking. Yeah. I had a little discrepancy with that, and I got it back. It's called thepetewilcoxshow.com. Wilcox has two L's, so it's P-E-T-E-W-I-L-L-C-O-X show.com. It's got songs on there. It's got our, my testimony is on there. And awesome. as things come up and new things develop, I'll be so delighted to share them. Awesome. Oh, by the way, I was so delighted. Did you say Jennifer is still with us? Yes, you said she was. Yes, Charlie's wife. I, she was such a darling woman, very, very fond of her. And uh, my goodness, I'm, I, Jennifer, I hope you see the show. I'm sending my love and my memory to you. You will always be a special girl in my heart. I'll never forget the love that you shared with me and, and Charlie. Thank you so much, baby. Oh. Yeah. All right, God bless you, brother. Bye-bye, buddy.
Thank you.